Earlier this year, tropical cyclones and torrential rain caused flooding across vast areas of Queensland and extensive damage to towns like Roma, Charleville and St George. But further west, the runoff resulted in a rare reinvigoration of deserts, creating wetlands where there's usually only red sand. It's giving scientists a rare opportunity to find out where the animals and plants that are currently thriving retreat to in the dry times. As Cathy McLeish reports, it's information they hope will help protect species when they're at their most vulnerable. The Simpson Desert is alive with new life. The landscape transformed by an event that's only happened three times in 100 years. We could come back here every year for the next 30 years and not see it like this. It's fantastic. Floodwaters pouring in from central Queensland and torrential inland rain have filled waterholes and wetlands. Some of the animals and plants which have come to life are rarely seen in the desert. Scientists are mounting expeditions to try and learn what they can before the water and the new animals and plants disappear again as they must. This guy's pretty vocal in the morning. That's just his normal good morning noise. Andrew Harper is loading up for a trek on a conservation property called Ithabuka, which covers 213,000 hectares of the desert. Doing it for 15 years now. So, I don't know, uh, many thousands of kilometres here. Yeah. Despite the advances in the science of conservation, the ships of the desert remain the favoured mode of transport. Even though you could, you know, load these camels blindfolded, every, every day is different, you know. That's the beauty of it. Um, you're seeing different country and you're working with different people, different ecologists. Um, so it's never boring, it's never monotonous, you know, at all. Oh, yeah. no, just... 150 years ago, camels were brought to Australia for the expedition by Burke and Wills, and their legendary um, status remains yeah, unchallenged in this terrain. Camels, I believe, are still the best way to explore the remote desert. It's, it's ironic that it's the, the circle's turned and we're back to where we were 150 years ago as far as desert um, exploration and documentation is concerned. Yeah. But new technology has its place here too. Solar-powered camel, this bloke, yep. Um, these uh, flexi panels were used to charge the 12-volt batteries that... Um, power our sat phones and in this day and age our digital cameras as well. Um, so we carry four 12 volt batteries and three sat phones on this trip. So a combination 19th century and 20th century. Yeah, it's all blended in together, yep. Andrew Harper loads and handles his camels using age-old Afghani traditions. But this is a journey of modern discovery. Morning, camels. Stand. Stand, camels. Stand, camels. A lot of people raise their eyebrows when they, they, they hear we're doing expeditions out here with, with pack camels because camels are a feral species and it's one of the, the things that we manage out here. But the, uh, in terms of a, a vehicle, um, uh, uh, the, the, the camels are incredible for getting us into really the remote parts of these, you know, these reserves and areas that we just simply haven't got to or surveyed before. And um, that's, you know, in terms of understanding the landscape and the dynamics within it, um, it's, it's been really amazing. And, uh, you know, the way Andrew and his crew um, run their... Run their um, expeditions it's it's just fantastic you know it's very sleek very you know sensitive in terms of uh, environmentally and um, they've got us to places that we just you just wouldn't be able to take a uh, you know a vehicle to so the the method we're using um, uh, for trapping on the sand dunes as well as out in the in the plains is a uh, pitfall traps but it's a good method of, of if there's any critters here we're likely to to grab them 
So do you almost always... Max Tischler is an ecologist with Bush Heritage Australia. He's monitoring the science of the big wet. These guys are incredible. Um, they spend most of their life buried in the sand and they slough an outer layer of skin and, and surrounds themselves in this sort of mucus layer and, um, you know, bury up to, you know, 50 centimetres into the ground. And they just lower their metabolism, lower their heart rate and, um, and, and go into this torpor, uh, awaiting for the next, the next rainfall event. And then they'll emerge again and, and uh, spend their time like this guy is, hopping around the dunes, feeding and, and breeding if there's freestanding water around. Ether Booker is his turf. He's been coming here as a researcher for a decade. But until now, he's only seen the dry side of the boom-bust cycle that typifies this country. It's really stunning. I've, I've been coming out here for a number of years, but n haven't seen anything, anything like it. And so, you know, we, we're, we're in, the, in the, the landscape and everything is just seems to be abundant you know we're down in the water holes we've got huge numbers of fish you know big productivity in the in the in the river system all the birds that are flocking to flocking there and then out on on these sand dunes you know we're getting new animals turning up um, and everything seems to be you know uh, just you know, prolific he's here to find out more about the boom times we've got a, a great uh, a great depth of knowledge in in, in what's here um, extending that extending that uh, research into you know, a complementary study and, and looking at, at, at what's in the floodplain is really important to understanding uh, you know, where these animals and, uh, are and, and how they respond under, under different types of conditions. Because of course, in boom years, they seem to spread out across the landscape. But in the dry times and when the resources drop, they'll all shrink back to you know, these small, uh, what they call dry time refugia. And as far as management goes, understanding where the animals are coming from, what they're doing in a good season and where they're going to shrink back to in the dry season is really critical. Today, the traps have captured a tiny but very exciting discovery. This um, looks to be um, a desert short-tailed mouse and we haven't caught one on the reserve um, until about... Um, well, we caught several about on the last camel trip about a month ago and... Um, they hadn't been caught here for 18 years. And as far as bush heritage goes, um, trying to work out where those refugias are, the dry time refugias are, is really important to manage in these guys so that we, uh, you know, we can... We can uh, stay them in between those. Exactly, exactly, and try and, um, and, try and um, you know, curtail any threats like, um, you know, feral predation by foxes and cats and that sort of thing. Ether Booker is privately owned by Bush Heritage Australia, a non-profit organisation funded largely by public donations. Ether Booker Station covers more than 200,000 hectares in the northeast corner of the Simpson Desert. It's in the middle of arid Queensland. But the east of the property is bordered by the Queensland Channel Country, and that's partly responsible for turning Ether Booker into a wetland. The property connects to the Simpson Desert National Park to the south and to the north its conservation values are extended by the Mulligan River Nature Refuge, Cravens Peak Bush Heritage Reserve and the Toko Ranges Nature Refuge. In all, about 2 million hectares of land in this area is now under protection, with the hope of bringing it back to its state before European settlement. The really big thing that we've seen probably uh, since 2007 is that we've had a number of consecutive wet years, uh, 2007, uh, last year and then this big season in 2010. So what we've seen is a, a massive uh, increase in the, in the vegetation. When that vegetation isn't being grazed, uh, it's all going back into the, the native food chain. All that, uh, that grass is going back into the, the native uh, critters. Botanists on this journey are making discoveries on a daily basis. This is fairly big range extension for this plant. It's a blue bush. It's called Mariana Pentagona. <laughs> they too have learned the lessons of history. Their painstaking work is punctuated by the knowledge that they are walking where some of the most enduring discoveries about this country have been made. I mean, at my herbarium, we're using we're using specimens 
daily that were collected by um, Banks and Cook in 1770. And so it's, it's, it's just amazing to realise you're sort of add, adding to that great, great sort of batch of history. And they really are the, the tools of our trade. And they'll be there forever for research. With their work done, the camels know the drill. After unloading, they're rewarded with a scratch. Oh, the camels are brilliant. Um, my old dog died last year, and so um, it's like having this huge dog wandering along behind you. Enthusiasts keen to participate in the voyage are also welcome along. Charlie Nicholson calls himself a green nomad. For us amateurs to have the real people along um, is, um, is pretty exciting. So there's always somebody rushing up with a, you know, come and look at this, or there's a piece of something here, um, you know, what is it? And um, quite often it turns out to be something pretty exciting. Well, I suppose I have to describe myself as an environmental bureaucrat, um, administering environmental protection acts and things like that. Yep. So it's a nice change to come out into some real life country where everything's being looked after and you don't have to go around uh, trying to correct things. And if the scientists' predictions are right, Ether Booker could well continue to blossom, at least for a while. They say the indications are another wet season will sustain this rare bloom of life for just a little longer, before it all goes back to surviving in the red sands. This is the only time I'll ever see it like that. I doubt it we'll see it again in, in my... What's the little left of my lifetime? <laughs> Um, this is, is truly absolutely remarkable, yeah. yeah. The camels are turned out for the night, but the scientists still have work to do. New traps are dug in preparation for the next day's discovery. And when the day's work is done, the timeless rhythm of the desert takes over, just as it did for our earliest explorers. Yeah.